All right, so let's go ahead and get started here. Um, my name is Chris Rogers. For any of you guys that I haven't met before, that just uh, jumping in here, uh, I'm a examiner in the Rocky Mountain region. I'm an instructor and trainer at Vail Mountain, and I'm on the PSIA ASI national team. And uh, this webinar is going to be all about the learning connection model, which is kind of the framework uh, that the national teams have been using over the last several years, really since the 2015 Interski in Ushuaia, to kind of frame all of our different models together. And uh, looking into doing some webinars more specifically in some of the technical skills, teaching skills, and people skills uh, fundamentals worlds down the road, but thought it would be good to start with just kind of an overall overview of the learning connection model. So the goal here will be uh, leaving this, you have a pretty good idea of kind of how it relates, what it is, how it relates to what we do as instructors, and, uh, and how it kind of ties all of the other framework together. Um, so I'm from Fairbanks, Alaska originally. I moved to Colorado in 2004 and started teaching in Steamboat and kind of have been all over in the last 15 years since then. I've uh, been teaching here in Vail for the last uh, seven years and part of that time was a training manager here in Vail as well. And um, kind of throughout that, I grew up skiing and snowboarding in Fairbanks. Uh, started skiing when I was pretty young, cross country skiing at a pretty young age, started downhill skiing and then uh, really spent more time snowboarding in the last couple of decades. Although I did just get my Alpine level one last year. And one of the things I really like about this model is how it, it blends between all of the disciplines. It's really not specific to any one discipline. And it's something that we can use to help understand what we do better and share what we do better, regardless of what equipment you're on. Uh, and it really, it really, for me, was an opportunity, uh, you know, when we were in Bulgaria presenting this at Interski last year, uh, to show how it really doesn't matter what equipment we're on. Good teaching is good teaching no matter what it is you're doing, whether it's uh, these last couple of weeks you've been quarantined at home and teaching your kids, or it's what we do up on the mountain every day, regardless of what you're doing. Right, good teaching is good teaching. And um, so that's what I hope you guys can get out of this today. And uh, I'll, I'll jump in here with a uh, start of a little bit of the presentation. We've done a really good job over the last 20, 30 years of providing content directly to our snow sports instructors. But we want our materials and educational tools to be available to everyone and anyone. We wanna grow the sport, we wanna grow our membership, we wanna grow the number of instructors that wanna work at resorts. And to do that, we gotta give them a taste of our educational material. We're excited to be here at beautiful Eldora Mountain Resort, and we can't wait to teach you how to ski. Let's get started. And Ski Magazine, we're doing a couple e-learning courses, which is really exciting. We're going to go from here to here at the bottom of the turn. We're hitting uh, different demographics, whether it's a new student in their e-learning course, or maybe it's breaking through to the intermediate zone. I'm here today to give you a few pointers for skiing steep terrain. People may be a great skier, and they're an intermediate skier, and they don't need to take a lesson. But through these courses, they may realize, wow, there's still stuff that I can learn and improve that allows me to get further and further out on the mountain. Some of the best, steepest terrain can be a little tricky to get into, which is why it's usually worth it. The further we can get people out into the mountain environment, the more hooked they're gonna be in snow sports. Our national teams, it's 33 members of the top snow sports instructors from around the country, and they're inspirational. They are the ones who are at the forefront of developing our, our future curriculum, developing our models, and kind of our image that we want to deliver out on the hill. Let's go take a look. You know, we need to find the future leaders of the snow sports industry, and people like Francesca and Brennan, they're it. You know, our membership was excited to see uh, Brennan and Francesca on the big screen in the Lauren Miller movie. To have them be able to ski at the level that they ski 
but also share their passion and ability to do what they do on groomers and beginners on intermediate train. That's just phenomenal. And hopefully it changes the perception of who we are as instructors. I started instructing um, just as a part-time job. Sure, I got into it to get paid and to be on my snowboard. And, and then you start to realize that you connect with your students and it really becomes more than just a job. I remain in it because it's just the coolest way to share the joys of skiing and snowboarding. You know, you see people connect with the sport and it, it seems to be like that life-changing moment for them where they decide, okay, skiing's gonna be a part of my life no matter what. One of my biggest goals at PSIASI is to share our message, share what our instructors do out on the hill. And Brenna and Francesca did that. They showed their passion, their love for the sport. And when you connect people like that with a guest, they're gonna love the sport for life. So what I love about that, that video, uh, we've used it for the last couple of years now since, Warren, since uh, the Warren Miller film that Brennan and Francesca were in, uh, is how it really does show what, uh, what makes a great snow sports instructor. And uh, yeah, it is, it is hard to watch some, some of that, like watch good skiing right now. I'm like looking outside in Avon and it's just starting to kind of turn from light snow into real snow. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's not where any of us would really expect to be right now, given a normal season. But uh, I'm excited you guys joined in and have an opportunity to, uh, to share some of the, the kind of more ethereal or, or mental side of, of skiing and snowboard instruction uh, while we've got some, some time here. Um, so what makes great snow sports instruction? And, and just, uh, you know, if you want to turn your mute off and, and say what it means to you, or if you want to throw it in the chat, what makes great snow sports instruction? When people are really personable um, with the with the student, definitely that personal connection, right on, Corey. Um, I, I think I found a couple things. Um, so I think I, I keep hearing patience is important, which seems to surprise me. But I think uh, maybe more important than just patience is authenticity. And so for me, that's patience. Maybe that's not patience for everyone. Patience, yeah, authenticity and patience. I like that, Nabil. Comments, Jen says passion is important. What else you guys got? What makes great, what, when you like see a phenomenal instructor out on the mountain, what is it that makes that person so good at what they do? I think really connecting with the student and understanding what they really want to get out of the lesson that day and um, being able to really hone in on that and and help them to achieve that however small that might be yeah i heard two things there both connecting with the student and also talking about their goals and motivations and helping them meet those for sure i think it's really about being passionate about what you're doing and getting excited when you see your students improve or achieve a goal that they've been wanting to achieve definitely kelby uh, in the comments we've got from Doug Fagel, sharing the love of the mountains and the thrill of riding in the winter terrain. From B. Cook, respect the learner, don't talk down to or belittle what they're learning. From Walter, connecting teaching to their goals. From Nancy, being present and devoting your full attention to the guest. And from Adir, there's having fun. You can see it in their students' behavior rather than adults or, rather adults or children. Uh, Lynn Hasday says engagement and empathy. So all of these, all of these elements, right? There's, I mean, we we know what great instruction looks like when we see it out on the on the hill, and and what the learning connection model tries to do is put that in a way that we can share a little bit more easily, dive into those elements, and then use that as a tool to help train and develop instructors uh, that we work with, whether we're in clinics or exams or uh, just out with our guests. So. We saw from, from Brennan and Francesca and from your examples, one, one area of great snow sports instruction. There's also Thumper. All right, little dudes, great to see you out here. My name is Thumper and I'm gonna be your cool ski instructor. 
his name is Denver. We're going to take it slow, take it easy, make sure everybody has a good time. Because what is skiing about? Having a good time. That's right. Now, just a few safety things to keep in mind. First of all, look straight ahead when you ski. If you look down, you're going to fall. You're going to have a bad time. Also, be aware of skiers around you. If you run into another skier, your skis are going to cross. going to have a bad time. So where's the part where we have a good time? Hey, little dude, you got some crap right here. Well, that's my face, sir. Okay, we're gonna do this without any pulls until we know our two primary feet positions. To go slow, we wedge our skis together in the shape of a slice of pizza. Then to go faster, we put them parallel like French fries. You see that? Pizza, French fries. Pizza, French fries. Well, hey, this is gonna be just like hey, Nick Shakey's, huh, fellas? Okay, let's have the little dude on the end try it first. What's your name? Ike. Okay, Mike, ski down to me. Go on, Ike. Pizza, fly, fly. Pizza, fly, fly. Okay, you see what he did? He French fried when he should have pizza. You French fry when you pizza, you're gonna have a bad time. All right, so the learning connection model, and you know what's funny is that that video has become uh, so many memes, and we've seen it so many times, just those last little bits about pizza and french fry, right? And it's like the probably the best known meme about skiing and snowboarding, but there's so much in that video from the people connection side of things where uh, Thumper forgot or, or misheard Ike's name and says calls him Mike. Uh, there's stuff in there about safety and, and setting goals and expectations, con you know, controlling terrain, um, all of these elements in that lesson that are actually things that we can dive into uh, as we go through these fundamentals. Uh, but it's it's interesting to me that that it always we always just start with that pizza and French fries pizza when there, when there's actually so much in there that's uh, that's valuable. Um, so learning connection model. If you're not familiar with this graphic yet, this is something you're going to want to become familiar with over the over the next. Uh, couple of months through the summer you got a great opportunity now to, to really dive into what this is um, it's it's in most of our new manuals it's in the new sports teaching manual and this framework is where everything's going in terms of organizing all of our models and in terms of in, in the future kind of uh, where things are going with the national standards and how exam exams and cert certifications in the future will be uh, laid out technical skills teaching skills and people skills and in 2015, at, at the uh, Interski Ushuaia, the team brought this model to Ushuaia and presented um, primarily around technical skills. The snowboard team presented some on people skills, but the technical skills side of things is where we've lived for most of the previous years prior to this, this last four year team cycle. And through the last four years, what the goal was, was to, to really build out the teaching skills and people skills and bring that full picture of what these fundamentals for technical skills, teaching skills, and people skills look like to the 2019 Interski and then to our to the United States and, and how it's gonna kind of push snow sports instruction forward over the next decade. Nobody's gonna go out with me. Have you asked anybody yet? No, but who would? I'm not gonna have any good skills. What do you mean? You know, like Nunchuck skills, bow hunting skills, computer hacking skills. Girls only want boyfriends who have great skills. Right, and guests only want instructors that have great teaching skills, right? So skills are important. And, and we've lived for the most part in the technical skills realm. We're a little bit more familiar with the content and the technical skills, um, than we are the teaching skills and, and people skills. The teaching skills and people skills information is, is really where we're gonna focus most of the conversation in, in this presentation. Um, and, but we do wanna kind of overview of the entire teaching skills, people skills, technical skills world. You know, I was having a conversation the other day with a friend of mine and he's like, the way you guys like have all these standards and curriculum and all this stuff. And he's like, I've always thought of snowboarding as you know, showing your individual style. And I'm like, when you watch somebody, you can tell this person's got mastery of movements or this person doesn't have mastery of movements. Think about breaking it down from there all the way down to the fundamentals. For the past few years now, the education leaders throughout the organization have been developing 
fundamentals that provide the specifics for the skills within the learning connection. We've been working with fundamentals or fundamental concepts throughout our organization, kind of starting in the technical skills realm. What are those basic truths that happen in any environment on any type of equipment? We started to then look at what are the fundamentals of what great teaching looks like. What's happened at Fall Conference is representatives from all over the country have come together to create a common language and a common story to what we do every day. People are very passionate about what happens divisionally. Like that's where their heart is. They want to share a what they're doing in their division, but then they also want to be inclusive of what we're trying to create. It's important that we get the opinions of everybody and then we kind of mix those around in a bowl and see which, which is the best that works for everybody. It's not that any one division has the answer. They're all coming together and finding the best resources and the best information that we have available so that we can create a common language that's our best language. National is the collective of, of the divisions, and they all have a seat at the table to shape where we're at now. We're bringing in the strength of these people skills and the teaching skills and the technical skills and saying that that's where the rubber meets the road. The fundamentals really express what about each of those skills is fundamental in great teaching? And then in the certification process, the national standards provide us with the ability to measure skill development. A member comes through the process, they demonstrate a variety of different assessment activities as we call them, and we have a common framework or common language using the fundamentals to measure the learning. What having fundamentals allows us to do is to start speaking from a similar platform so that whenever we're talking, we can tie it right back to the fundamentals, we can tie it to the learning outcomes, and it'll help create that consistent message for the members so that it's clear to them how to develop as an instructor and we can do a better job coaching them moving forward. The consistency really drives it. You can really see that when we do get people in a room or on the hill from all over the country and they all are bringing the same story and they all are speaking the same language. For the first time we'll really see what it means to be an American ski instructor, not just a Rocky Mountain instructor or an instructor from the Eastern Division. We're really just shaping that American identity for ski instruction and that is really exciting stuff. It's just continuing that evolution of the American teaching system and saying what's what do our guests need that we're not just gonna task and drill them through how to learn to ski or snowboard but we want to create an environment where they get to play and learn through that exploration. It's not just about your skiing. You're gonna have to be able to teach in a way that connects you with the student. If we think of the things that we can actually affect as humans, lift ticket prices, the weather, all these things we can't control. But we can train to people skills. And it's the experiences with our guests, it's the guest service we provide them. If there's a lot of other variables that we can't control, let's focus on the ones we can. So, Starting from the technical skills, because it's a little bit of a review and, and just uh, to run through them. Uh, the technical skills side of things is where the alpine skiing fundamentals live. It's where the snowboarding fundamentals live, cross country, telemark. Uh, each of the disciplines has worked to develop fundamentals using the same framework, the same language. And the goal with that, just like what was said in the video, is to have a common language so that when we, when we boil things down, uh, we're starting from the same place. If you're at alpine, uh, skier working on a snowboard cert or just uh, working with somebody who is a snowboarder, you've got the same language to understand how the, the equipment relates, how movements re relate to body movements, how body movements relate to board performances or to ski performance. Um, and then two elements that are the same across all of the disciplines, conveying accurate technical information and movement analysis, that OEP format of, of movement analysis. Um, that makes up our technical skills fundamentals. And really quick, wanted to pop up the alpine skiing and the snowboarding fundamentals uh, side by side. And the reason for that is to show how similar these are. So the, the alpine skiing fundamentals have been out for five, six years now. And, and really, um, you know, people are pretty familiar with them at this point. On the snowboard side, we've been using the fundamental movements of the body, uh, body movements, flex extension rotation. 
and the board performances, tilt, twist, pivot, and pressure. And in combining those into the snowboard fundamentals and writing them in the same language as alpine skiing, it puts that relationship together. So these are almost identical. Uh, the difference being that the movements we might use to create some of those performances between the ski or the snowboard are going to be a little bit different, right? So uh, flex and extension of the ankle is going to move the center of mass fore and aft over the ski, whereas it's going to move the, the center of mass over the toe or heel side edge of the snowboard. So that 90 degree relationship. The only other difference, the reason there's six snowboard fundamentals versus five alpine skiing fundamentals uh, is that that board performance of twist, right? The ability, if you think about wringing out a washcloth, that ability to uh, flex one ankle, extend the other ankle, and twist the snowboard along its length. While a ski can do that, with a snowboard, we're doing it very intentionally, uh, and, and we thought it was important to capture that as a separate fundamental. So uh, if you know the alpine skiing fundamentals, you know the snowboard fundamentals, you just need to add that longitudinal twist in there. And each of the disciplines has worked to create that similar language uh, and really have this, this base where we're describing how body movements affect ski performance, snowboard performance. And um, we think it's gonna be a good step forward in terms of how we communicate those um, in the future. Um, before I jump in uh, onto teaching and people skills, any, uh, any questions on the technical skills side of things on, on the snowboard fundamentals, alpine skiing fundamentals, any of those areas? Question on the snowboard fundamentals, is that like in the new snowboard manual or is that something that you created to juxtapose with the Alpine? So the, uh, the snowboard fundamentals are out on the, on the web. They have not been published uh, as snowboarding fundamentals in any of the manuals. They are in the teaching snow sports manual, uh, pretty close to what the finding wor final word wording is as examples of fundamental relationships. Um, there was like, so Kind of to what that video is speaking to the the national is made up of all the divisions the <laughs> cody's got quite the dog love going on there that's awesome I, I wish i had a dog yeah uh so the the process of of kind of approving something like that it isn't just like national came in and said here's the six snow word fundamentals now everyone needs to adapt to it this was a national task force project that came from leaders from across the country and um, uh, working on wordsmithing that and kind of, kind of agreeing on those fundamentals took several years. So in the last published manual, the snow sports, technical, uh, snow sports teaching manual is, uh, is a list of them published as examples of fundamental relationships. It's not published as the fundamentals, but uh, they are now kind of adopted across all of the divisions. And just a reminder there, if, you are, if you're just uh, tuning in, if you can mute yourself, would be really great. Any other questions on those before we move on? Cool. So the teaching skills and people skills is really where the majority of the work over the last few years has been happening. And, and this was two cross-discipline uh, task forces at fall conference as well as uh, members of the national team that, that spent the time to really dis distinct, make, make a distinction between what are teaching skills and what are people skills. And, and the goal here in pulling these apart is not to say, well, now I'm using teaching skills and now I'm using people skills or like right now I'm teaching and right now I'm connecting. The goal in pulling them apart and making a distinction between teaching skills and people skills is so that we can evaluate and train, right? So we can identify areas where people need help with teaching skills or people need help with, with people skills. And so as we dove into this, we made a, a pretty massive list of elements that define great teaching. And this came from conversations from, with, with instructors all over the country and all over the world. And then we started taking that list and paring it down and, and saying, well, where does this belong? Is this a teaching element or is this a people skills element? Uh, and as, as that list became more and more clear, a couple of defining things came out. The primary one being that people skills are what connect the instructor to the student or connect me to you. Teaching skills are what connect the instructor and the student to the learning environment. And if we use that lens to, dis to make that distinction between what are teaching skills and what are people skills, it made it pretty easy to separate. And the easy way to think about that is those people skills are 
what we're doing right now when you introduce yourself or meet someone, um, you know, when you greet someone at your door, obviously six feet apart, but um, if you're at a, at a bar, the way that you would introduce yourself and build a relationship with someone outside of a learning environment, outside of teaching, those are people skills. As soon as you involve a learning environment, we go into the teaching skills side of things. And you are often jumping back and forth or using those skills simultaneously. So if you think about a guest walking up at, uh, at lineup, and as they're walking up, you're already starting to make some observations, right? But based on the way they're walking, based on the way they're carrying their equipment, uh, you're using your teaching skills to make some assessments. And as they get up to you, you put your goggles up and you introduce yourself. Hey, I'm Chris, I'm gonna be your instructor today. Those are the people skills right there. But at the same time, you're using those teaching skills based on what they're saying, what they're telling you their goals are. You're starting to build this relationship with them and you're using that relationship to inform your teaching skills. So they're happening simultaneously. And I, I think it's really important that we stress this. This isn't like these silos that you're gonna live in. Like, oh, I have great teaching skills and I'm using my teaching skills right now and now I'm using my people skills. Um, it really, the goal in separating these was to give us that ability to, to come up with frameworks that say, this is what good people skills are, this is what good teaching skills are, and here's how we train and develop those. Um, so I, I hope that's really clear because everything else kind of builds from there. So starting with teaching skills, um, these are the six that came out. As you know, everything as, as we made this massive list and all of the teaching skills over here and all the people skills over here, and then we started to sort those down into here's, here's, these are kind of mean the same thing. Let's wordsmith this, that, that takes care of that. You know, that, that whole collaborative process ended up with these six as the teaching skills collaborate on long term goals and short term objectives, manage information, activities, terrain selection, and pacing, promote exploration, experimentation, and play. Facilitate the learner's ability to reflect upon experiences and sensations, adapt to the changing needs of the learner, and manage emotional and physical risk. So collaborate on long-term goals and short-term objectives. That student walks up and they say, hey, here's what my goal is for today, right? And you're taking that information you received from them and you're helping build a, sh a short-term objective based on the goal that you received from them, right? So they might have had their long-term goal and then you're using that long-term goal and helping build some short-term objectives based on that. And that word collaborate is so key, right? This isn't, uh, this isn't a, this is a hallmark of the American teaching system is that we're student-centered. And so asking the guests what they wanna do, we're not just telling them you need to bend your knees, right? This is uh, building a lesson plan based on what they're looking to get out of it and using our experience as instructors to help get them there. Manage information, activities, terrain selection, and pacing. Uh, this is getting into how we do our job, right? It's, it's uh, talk, pace versus action, uh, pacing, the, the kind of that talk versus action side of things. Um, where you go, that terrain selection, we all know what happens if we over-terrain our students, they get scared, we under-terrain them, they get bored. This kind of falls in there, managing that information and pacing of the day. Promote exploration, experimentation, and play. Again, this, is, uh, this isn't um, usually a, a webinar. Uh, this is how we build an experiential learning system so that they are going out and they're exploring their abilities, they're exploring the environment, they're exploring their skills. You're giving them tools to experiment with and letting them play with them. Um, this could include things like themes in your lesson. This can include games. So a lot of different elements of how we do our job that tie into uh, the teaching skills individually. Facilitate the learner's ability to reflect upon experiences and sensations. This is where we're getting into movement analysis, but more than that, that, that a great instructor gives the students the information they need to be able to make self-assessment. So at a basic level, facilitating the learner's ability to reflect upon experiences and sensations, this can just simply be telling them they did, they kind of did what you're asking them to do or they didn't do it, let's try it again. But at a high level, this can include giving them kinesthetic cues or verbal auditory cues where you can ask them to um, you know, feel this in your ankle or feel your shin pushing against the boot. In doing so, you're facilitating that learner's ability to reflect upon their own experiences and sensations. Adapting to the changing needs of the learner, this is where we're getting into moving the lesson forward as you see them uh, learning. So 
Uh, are, are they looking like they're picking it up really quickly? You're gonna move your, your lesson along more, more rapidly. Are they needing some extra practice time? Um, this is using that teaching cycle to speed up, slow down, adapt to their needs, teach them the next thing, go back to practice time, um, making that, uh, giving you that ability to, um, to really continue to, to adapt with the learner is what we're talking about here. And then finally, manage emotional and physical risk. Physical risk is pretty obvious. We, we deal with that every day. Um, emotional risk, we, we've kind of described as kind of perceived risk. So a lot of times a student may have more of a perception of risk than the actual risk. And that can often be that emotional, that feeling of emotional risk. And um, going into like a bunch of studies about why people uh, might maybe don't ski or snowboard. And there's been some surveys that the National Skiers Association and the PSIA and snow operating have done that ask people, why haven't they learned how to ski or snowboard? And you get into the fear of falling, the fear of looking, looking stupid, um, the fear of being cold, the fear of getting hurt, kind of those elements come up. That's what we're talking about in that managing emotional risk. Any, uh, any questions on teaching skills before I jump forward from here? Like there will be option, uh, opportunity for questions at the end as well, but want to give people opportunity as we go. So one of the other key pieces with the teaching fundamentals is that it's not replacing the, uh, the teaching and learning cycle, right? So looking at, at the new teaching snow sports manual, we pull in this uh, simplified version of the, of the learning cycle. You go from welcome and introduction into assessing students, determining goals and planning experiences, creating experiences for learning, guiding practice, and that circle goes around and around and around. Sometimes it jumps in between stages, and then at the end, that review and preview. Um, so this, this doesn't replace, um, teaching skills doesn't replace uh, the, the, the teaching cycle, but it has a, a good bit of interplay, right? So if you look at the way these, these kind of interact, the teaching cycle is a lot more about how we do it. Like in a lesson, you're gonna use that teaching cycle. The fundamentals, when we talk about the fundamentals, these are things that are always true, right? And so uh, these are, the fundamentals are a little bit more of a base level. The teaching cycle kind of sits above that as how we do it. Hopefully that makes sense. So uh, another example of great instruction here. So jump into this one. All right, so maybe not the best example of, of strong teaching, uh, although I definitely want pizza now. This one is actually maybe a little bit more indicative of what we're trying to go with. started very easy the right pedal goes on the right side hand on there and just turn the pedal back just like this and magically it tightens it up done tighten it up 
that's it. Head along. Little wiggle. That's good. Right. Do you want to put your foot on there for me? That's it. Give it a scoop when you're ready. Look where you're going. Look at the horizon. Off you go. Wow, look at you go. Put my hand on your back. I hold you like that. And then you put your feet on the pedals. Okay. You ready? And then look where you're going. Let go of your brakes and off you go. One, two, three, okay. Pedal. Another pedal. That's it. And stop. Brakes. You do the wobbly bit. You wobble. Can't wobble anywhere. You're not going to go anywhere. Keep your brakes on. Put your pedals, feet on the pedals. That's it. And I've got your back and I've got your side. There you go. Look where you're going. It's all clear. One. Two, three, go, let go of your brakes, off you go. And stop. Look how far you've ridden on your own. Wow. That's a long way. You see how many paces it is? One, two, three. Ten paces. Back this time. The little handle, you've got a handle growing out the back. And I'll hold the bike. Feet on the pedal. Look where you're going. After three, you're going to let go of the brakes and you're going to pedal off. Okay. One, two, three. Go, let go of the brakes. Off you go. Wow. She's off. Bye bye. Send us a postcard. Hi, love. <laughs> so I love that video because it really does highlight great instruction. Uh, and, and really, if you, we go through that list of the teaching fundamentals, you can see throughout it how we collaborate on long-term goals and short-term objectives. I mean, we can uh, infer from the video that she wanted to learn how to ride the bike. And as, as her instructor, uh, he built a list of, of short-term objectives to work through and, uh, and help her accomplish that long-term goal. Manage information activities, terrain selection and pacing. He was in an appropriate area, um, pacing was good. He, he built a set of activities that helped her achieve those objectives and goals and managed how she moved through that progression. Promote exploration, experimentation, and play. This wasn't just a step one, two, three. He took uh, kangaroo hops. He took wiggles into it. He, he stepped back to exaggerate the distance cycled so that she could have a greater sense of accomplishment. Facilitating the learner's ability to reflect upon experiences and sensations throughout that. He was giving her things to feel or telling her places to put her feet, um, giving her those, those pieces of, of experiences. As she ac accomplished objectives, she adapted to those changing needs and built that progression further. And then throughout, you could see the ways he was managing her emotional and physical risk, starting with pedals off, putting one pedal on, holding onto her clothes, holding the bike, uh, you know, taking those steps back again, giving that sense of emotional and physical risk. So throughout that video, we get to see some examples of really good, really good instruction. A uh, couple of questions here. Oh, yeah, um, so Jen threw in here the actual pages. So the Alpine Fundamentals are in the Teaching Snow Sports Manual, page 143. And then that's followed by Cross Country and Telemark and then the Snowboard Examples of uh, Fundamental Relationships. That final wordsmithing on the Snowboard one is a little bit different than how it was published in the Teaching Snow Sports Manual, but it's pretty similar. Uh, Joe Q seems that managing emotional and physical risk crosses over between teaching and people skills. Would this be accurate? Love this video, volume-based teaching. Um, Yep, so we'll get into that a little bit as we get into the people skills, but there is definitely some crossover between teaching skills and people skills when it comes to emotional and physical risk. And I'll, I'll touch on that as we get into the people skills side of things. Uh, any other questions on teaching skills before we move into the overview of people skills?
Okay. So on the people skills world side of things, uh, we separate out develop relationships built on trust, based on trust, engage in meaningful two-way communication, identify, understand, and manage your emotions and actions, and recognize and influence the behaviors, motivations, and emotions of others. So these four elements came out, and again, wordsmithing them down, pairing them down to just a couple of, based on, you know, from the 20 that were originally on the list. We thought it's really important, like when, you, when you're talking about those skills, again, that you use when you meet somebody at your front door or introduce yourself at a coffee shop, right? You're gonna develop a relationship based on trust. You're gonna engage in meaningful two-way communication. You're gonna identify, understand, manage your emotions and actions. And you're gonna recognize and influence behaviors, motivations, and emotions of others. Developing relationship based on trust, if we go to that example of, of the guest walking up to you at, at, right at the beginning of the day, we carry a little bit of implied authority based, based on our uniform. So there's already a, a foundation of trust. They've paid for a lesson, they're coming out, you've been assigned to them as their instructor. Just like a policeman on a corner, you have a kind of an implied relationship of trust right from the beginning. Uh, but you're still going to do things to, to build that trust, right? One of the ones we constantly reference is just putting your goggles up, making that eye contact and, you know, greeting them. Again, now this might maybe six feet apart and not shaking hands, bumping elbows instead. But those elements of greeting and starting to build that relationship based on trust. And this is something that happens throughout the lesson. Anytime you provide information using those teaching skills, you're affecting that trust relationship. So if you are giving them information they're having success with, you're gonna to continue to elevate that trust. If you're giving them information that is taking away, maybe they're not having success with, that's where you might be uh, losing some of that trust. And you kind of think about trust as that bank account where you're coming in and out, you're adding or, or withdrawing from that account. Um, Two-way communication, obviously highly important. Um, having that opportunity that we're not just talking at them, we're not just, uh, doing one directional snow sports instruction. We have that opportunity to receive feedback from them. That's what we use that feedback uh, from them to, to build using our teaching skills. If we're not listening to our guests, we're not going to put out the best lesson. And so that two-way communication is so important. Uh, and then uh, knowing your own emotions. And this is where we really get into the emotional intelligence side of the people skills. And you know, for years we've said throughout skis, the kind of the ski industry, we, we'd rather hire, hire people that are good or, or average skiers and, and maybe don't know how to teach, but have good people skills. And we can teach them how to teach and we can teach them how to ski, right? It's, we're really good at teaching people how to ski. That's what we do as ski instructors. We can do that. We're pretty good at teaching people about how to teach. We're, we've been training for a while. We know how to train people how to teach, but you can't teach people skills. That's been kind of what we've said in the ski industry for the last 40, 50 years. And meanwhile, the whole Silicon industry, industry, Silicon Valley industry, the big businesses, Fortune 500 companies have invested heavily in this idea of emotional intelligence. And uh, there's this entire industry that's grown up around how you train people skills. And so one of the things that's so key about this learning connection model is that we're embracing that idea that you can train people skills. Now, it's also really important to say we're not talking about personality. We're not trying to train personality or tell people like you have a bad personality for teaching, you need to work on this. We're talking about trainable skills and behaviors, right? Things that you can do to grow your emotional intelligence, to be a better connector with people. And, and I think what's really important here is throughout exams, in my experience as an examiner and in training people, there are people who have been unsuccessful in their exams based on people skills, but have never received that feedback because we had not given ourselves permission or, or created a metric to evaluate people skills. And I would say that even goes for our education staff as well. We have examiners who have not had training or, or opportunity to grow in their people skills and maybe haven't done as good of a job as they could have if we'd given ourselves that permission. And so moving into this, into this realm where we use this people skills um, and, and use these metrics and start to build and grow our, our, our people skills side of things, it gives us permission to give people that feedback. You know, this was actually really good teaching, but you didn't create a connection with the guest. And that's something that someone can work on. 
we don't have to just hire good people, people and teach them how to teach and teach them how to ski. We can hire people that are good teachers and teach them those people skills of connecting. We can hire people that are great skiers and teach them how to teach and teach them some of those connecting skills. Uh, and this will be a big step as we move forward uh, over the next couple of years. Uh, this, the really nice thing that the uh, people skills group did is they, they boiled this down to just these four words, trust, communication, me and you, makes it really easy to remember the, uh, the people skills fundamentals, uh, trust, uh, communicate, me and you. So uh, trusting, building, building that relationship based on trust, uh, creating two-way communication, knowing and understanding your own emotions and knowing and being able to uh, manage and, and adapt to other people's emotions. And just being able to remember those four makes it uh, pretty, pretty easy to keep that one in mind. So then this is that list of all of our fundamentals up, up on one screen, the Alpine skiing fundamentals, the snowboard fundamentals, kind of those technical skills side of things, teaching skills fundamentals, people skills fundamentals. And this builds the framework for basically everything we're going to do in the next decade with the organization. This will filter into the new national standards. Uh, this will grow training and development materials around teaching skills, around people skills. And when you look at these, at these lists and, and really still highlighting the teaching skills and people skills, these are things that you can see and say, yeah, someone's doing that or, or no, they're not. Like, these are fundamentals of, of good instruction. And, and all of us have seen examples of great instruction and of poor instruction out, out in the mountains in our ski schools and around different areas. And if you, if you think back to, to a, a memory of something that you learned, an instructor that taught you something, whether it was skiing or snowboarding or something entirely different, and you look at these lists, there are probably areas that highlight why they were so good at doing that. Or if you had a lesson, a really poor lesson experience, there are elements on here that probably describe why that lesson experience wasn't as good as it could have been. So John, let's see, can exaggerating, can exaggerating accomplishments, for example, stepping back, be offering inaccurate feedback and, and or be detrimental to progress? Said differently, how important is accurate feedback to building trust? Could exaggerating accomplishments be detrimental um, if the student realizes it was actually an exaggeration? Yeah, it, it absolutely could play into, into that trust relationship. I think in the case with a kid, you know, using that, that game, um, you might get into a little bit of, uh, of uh, seeing if they're catching on that you're playing with them and you, know, you can make it fun, not like, hey, I tricked you. Um, with an adult, you're probably not gonna take that same, same step of, of exaggerating that, that accomplishment, but, We've all done that in small ways in our lessons when you congratulate someone for doing a very basic step, right? Like, um, like oh, that was, that was a great first turn. Yeah, nice job. When maybe it was a very okay, mediocre first turn. But building up that sense of accomplishment, congratulating people, giving them that encouragement is important. And you do have to balance that with that building that relationship based on trust. So if you're taking that to an extreme to where if they found out that you weren't that you were exaggerating that, they were gonna lose trust. You, you definitely have to balance that, for sure. Um, Justin, I would argue that even those who have already considered to be good teachers can improve their teaching by building their people skills. 100% agree. And, and this is where, again, we, we're pulling these apart to look at them so that we can build metrics and build skills and build tools, look at different ways to train emotional intelligence, to train uh, people how to develop better communication skills and, and create better connections with guests but by no means are we saying that those aren't fully integrated when we're actually out on snow. And, and, and you know, a great teacher, even a great teacher and a great people skills person, by pulling these, these apart, we can start to identify areas where maybe we just didn't do a good job that, in that specific lesson, right? So as you reflect on previous lessons, and if you use those six teaching skills and four people skills fundamentals as a, a lens to reflect on those lessons, maybe there's one that you, you missed today. Or maybe there's a couple that you did really well today. And using those as that training lens um, gives us that opportunity to grow, even if you're already a great instructor and a, and a great teacher and a great, great with people skills, right? We can always improve. And using, 
using these measurable behaviors and skills lets us train and develop from where we are. Cool, any other questions on teaching skills or people skills? Right on, so that's kind of where we were when we went to Interski. We spent the last four years, the team kind of inherited uh, this learning connection model and, and the progress that had already been done from the previous team and, and what wasn't presented at, at Ushuaia. And, and there the question was, um, what makes great instruction? And, and that carried us through this term with building out those teaching skills and people skills. And um, it is absolutely a, a highlight of my life getting to be part of the team that presented that to the inner ski in, in Bulgaria last spring. And um, uh, we, Matt Boyd and I presented the teaching skills side of things. Um, uh, another group presented the people skills and we had on snow presentations kind of uh, delving into the technical skills side of things. But really the full picture of the learning connection model was presented at, at this 2019 inner ski. And then this last year, we've been bringing it back to the US presenting this as this package here. And the goal of the next team will be to carry this forward uh, over the next three years, the next inner ski, to show how that's now gonna influence and impact the organization. And uh, this, is, this is where things start to get a little bit exciting in terms of how it's going to move us forward from the American teaching system and, and what's been done over the last uh, number of years into the future of PSIA and AASI. So a little recap from inner ski and then uh, we'll jump into the future. Yeah, so inner ski is a really important aspect to, to what we do and, and coming here helps us refine our message as well as it helps us to learn where we need to go in the future. Our team is presenting the learning connection which actually was introduced four years ago at the Ushuaia Interski and where we've come since then, how the learning connection has evolved. We've developed a new teaching snow sports manual as last time we asked, what is great teaching? Now our big question to everybody is, what truly makes a great snow sports instructor? What are the skills? What are the attributes? What are the things that actually create an exceptional learning environment for guests and students on the hill? That's what we're presenting as a team. And as part of the learning connection, that people skills section is super critical as we believe a deeper connection is truly critical to getting more people engaged in the sport and keeping them in the sport longer. And over the last four years, we've really worked hard to um, align our fundamentals across the entire uh, industry, uh, no matter if you're alpine, snowboard, cross country, adaptive, telemark, it doesn't matter. It's, we all have our technical fundamentals, what we believe are truths. And then we have our teaching fundamentals. Every discipline was in the mix of that. So teaching is teaching. Um, the same with people. People skills are people skills, no matter what you run on. And that, that's a powerful message with the U.S. and what we're bringing to the, to the world. It's just amazing how it pushes us as an association to continue to drive and push forward not only our message, but to reach out and to ask other countries, you know, what their thoughts are on what the future of snow sports or what snow sports education is all about. All right, all right. What a week. Tons of learning, great sharing. Already starting to think ahead of what we can do to take our association forward and what we can do for Interski and the future of snow sports and the growth of snow sports. We just finished up with the final runs. All the teams dropped one more time for the closing ceremony. And then all countries side by side, everybody drops all at once, a massive short turn festival down the demo slope. Oh. 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 
A really long week, jam-packed with all kinds of excitement. Interski 2019, Pomparovo, Bulgaria. Thank you very much. All right, so where this goes from the fundamentals, starting, starting with each of the, the fundamentals, uh, teaching skills, technical skills, and, and people <laughs> skills, we go into learning outcomes. And, and I'm gonna give a real brief uh, overview here. This is, this is where things start to get real dense uh, in terms of what the team has been working on and, and the national task forces. Uh, there's probably a few people on here who just cringed when I said the word learning outcomes. But uh, learning outcomes, so the fundamentals, as they exist, explain what great instruction is, but they don't say how that applies to a level one, a level two, or a level three candidate. And so when you, as a, really when it comes to anything, when you want to, to find out how you're doing, you need to test yourself against someone else or something else in that same realm, right? We, we need a standard, some other outside organization to, to kind of uh, verify what you're doing. And so in the case of PSIA and ASI, we're working with Penn State to put all of our education materials into this um, kind of academia uh, framework. Uh, so learning outcomes comes out of that kind of academia world and it is a, is a statement that describes how a fundamental is applied to each individual level of a certification. Um, from those learning outcomes, we go to assessment criteria. And those are the things that uh, that you would show to show that you've accomplished that outcome. So as a su successful candidate at a level three in this realm of teaching, this is what it looks like to be successful. And then from there, we go to a performance guide, which gives you examples in, of, of experiences and those activities that are used to assess uh, the criteria. So taking kind of this nebulous world of, of from the national standards that says this is what a level three, a level two, a level one means, and taking all that information from across all nine or eight now uh, divisions and, and all of the different disciplines and saying, this is what would make sense as a national curriculum um, and putting it together as if it was a class. And what that'll lead to eventually is a PSIA certification that could be valued as part of a, a two or a four year degree in resort management because our education materials that already exist will now be fit into this framework of uh, learning outcomes, assessment criteria, performance guide that fits into that academic world. So there's a ton of work being done on the back end to make all of this. It's not gonna make sense in this one short webinar and, and just kind of this tail end, but I, I think it's important to give you guys an idea of, of where this fundamental work is going. So the technical skills triangles go to the fundamentals. The fundamentals turn into learning outcomes at each level. The assessment activities or assessment criteria is how that would be um, accomplished that learning outcome, how, how we can show that someone's accomplished that, that outcome. So if you say, well, a learning outcome, um, you should be able to understand this, the assessment criteria, we're gonna say, well, how do you show understanding? And then that performance guide uh, will really be one of the most valuable tools this organization has ever had, as it will be a list of, um, elements that would mean someone were successful successful or unsuccessful at any given level for any given criteria at each at each level of, of certification. So um, to give you a little bit of an example of what this looks like, um, shrink this window. So this is out of the, the framework for teaching skills and breaking those fundamentals down to that level one, level two, level three world. So under assess and plan, um, you could look at planning and organizing relevant learning experiences for the group with a realistic learning outcome in the beginner zone. At a level two, that steps up to plan and adapt relevant learning experiences for the group with realistic learning outcomes in the intermediate zone. And at the level three, identify a theme, plan, and adapt learning experiences with individualized realistic learning outcomes in the advanced zone. So all three of those address the same fundamentals, but they address them specific to the levels of certification. And that goes through um, teaching skills, people skills, and technical skills. All of the national task forces have been working on this for the last uh, two to three years 
to put them into this into this framework. And if we just take one of these, so a level three candidate in the implement phase of teaching with individualized learning environments that maximize students' engagement in their learning process and guide them towards agreed upon outcomes. This is just one of those learning outcomes. We'd say a level three candidate should be able to do this. So now we take that to assessment criteria, which are ways that we could say, yes, this person has implemented uh, this at the level three. So a level three candidate should customize and pace learning activities that promote exploration, experimentation, and play towards the desired outcomes. They should tailor the learning environment to align with the changing needs of the individual. They should provide relevant information to individuals at a rate that engages them in their learning process. And they should manage individual concerns of emotional and physical risk to maximize engagement in the learning environment. So again, boiling this down to a little bit finer detail. And we go from that, we just take one of those, tailor the learning environment to align with the changing needs of the individuals. And we can look at the successful and unsuccessful attributes for that uh, element of the exam. So recognize changes in individual performance and modify the lesson accordingly. Or on the unsuccessful side, they did not acknowledge or address changes in individual performance. So coming down to these really bullet points and this performance guide would be available for every member to look at for each level of the certification and really study as part of how they're going into the exam. As on the examiner side, it gives the framework for where that feedback goes. And as, as you're giving feedback to candidates, it's gonna fall into these realms so that when they take that study guide back and they've got their feedback from their examiner and, they, and, you know, and you're their trainer at their home mountain, you're able to go to, to that performance guide with them and look at the elements that were not successful or were successful. So taking a lot of that um, perception of subjectivity out of it and putting some real objective framework behind the certifications. And again, this is uh, across disciplines, across divisions, uh, leaders from, across, from throughout the organization building these performance guides. Um, and this is all material that's, uh, that's pretty much submitted and, and working its way forward in terms of what the future of, of certification of our organization, of our education materials, it's building this framework that's gonna help move the organization forward. All right, a few other questions in here. Um, from Lynn Hasday, what are your thoughts when relating the CAP model to the learning connection model? So uh, cognitive, effective, and psychomotor model into the learning connection model. Um, and this is where, you know, we're not, in building out the learning connection model, we are not replacing or getting rid of all of the other models that we use throughout instruction. Models are, are there to show us how we accomplish specific goals the fundamentals and the learning connection model help us organize that information. And that goal of the learning connection model is not to create um, a whole bunch of new material. It's to, to kind of organize all of that content that's all over the place and bring it into this, this one framework that helps us um, train and, and develop ourselves and other instructors. So the CAP model fits in, um, you know, it fits into technical skills in terms of where an instructor is uh, being able to, to understand and convey technical information. It, it affects teaching skills in terms of how an instructor uh, is understanding and, and building and, and working their lesson, changing their lesson based on the needs of their students. Uh, and there's absolutely elements of the CAP model that inform that relationship between instructor and student, between me and you. And so um, CAP model is one of those models that um, is, is a lot more about the how, whereas the learning connection model is a lot of the what. The, the what we do as instructors and the fundamentals of what we do as instructors. Uh, Jane Tarlow, asking our students what makes great instructors is another never ending source of learning for our pros. Absolutely. And uh, for more information on motivational feedback and genuine acknowledgement of successes, see Gabby Wolf uh -huh. and Rebecca uh, on optimal theory of motor learning. Yeah, um, there's some phenomenal books um, I mean, just so the basics on emotional intelligence and emotional intelligence 2.0 it's books that get into um, some of these elements of people skills. There's also one on uh, emotional ability and there's one called social intelligence, uh, as well as just the classic uh, how to win friends and influence people. There's, there's so much material and, you know, we've all got lots of time, more time than we expected to have this summer. So a uh, good opportunity to jump on some of those, those reading lists. 
Uh, Brian, you had a question. Yes, Chris. Um, thank you. <clears throat> regarding the <clears throat> excuse me, uh, regarding the standards during the exam process, um, I'm in the Eastern Division and I'm registered for was registered right for the Dev exam in um, a couple weeks ago. So in that scoring process, uh, it's I'm trying to get an idea of where, how far above the level three standard would we be expected to score, uh, um, say for that exam, compared to, say current dev team members or DC, um, I'm sorry, ETS or, or examiners themselves. It's it's almost so hard to get an idea of where, where that standard is. What what's expected of us? Are we expected to just polish it, you know, at that level for the for that exam? or just kind of, you know, of course, show a solid understanding at the level three level, and then are we developed beyond that on the team, once we make the team? You know, for for specific questions on on the Eastern Dev team, I'd want to defer to like Brian Donovan or, or um, you know, any of the examining crew out there. Um, but in general, when you look at kind of that job of an examiner or or a trainer versus the level one, level two, level three standards. We have the national standards for uh, kind of uh, level one, level two, level three. When we get into the training world and the ed staff world, those those are still held by the divisions. Um, in terms of like in my experience working through like uh, with national and with as an examiner on the Rocky Mountain side of things and, and in hiring on the Rocky side of things, what I'm looking for is a really polished understanding of that level three world, kind of everything through the level three, and that ability to move fluidly between the levels, the ability to understand your own performance and movements, and the ability to adapt and, and change uh, throughout that standard kind of on the fly. But there is a little bit of, so at the level three, at the level three you get feedback. At all of our levels of, of examining, you get feedback in that exam process. And I think one of the things that separates you as a trainer, as an examiner, is to have such a strong understanding of your own body and biomechanics and presentation and affect that you can change that based on what you're feeling, your own kinesthetic um, feeling of what you're doing. And the reason, the reason that does create a slightly higher standard is, is that as a trainer, you're in front of the group, you demonstrate a movement pattern you need to know if you didn't do that correctly. You can't rely on that group to give you feedback. You need to be able to change your demonstration on the fly and be like, oh, I wasn't doing that right. Hey guys, did you see how I made this movement? This wasn't actually what I was trying to demo. Let's do that again, right? And so at a level three standard, I expect someone to be able to perform at that level three level with some feedback. Hey, this wasn't quite it. Can you change this? Yep, that was it, sweet. At a trainer or an examiner standard, I expect that person to be able to make that change without feedback. And I think that does raise the bar of the standard, even if the actual standard of writing itself isn't any, any higher. Thank you, that was excellent, thank you. Yeah, no worries. Other questions? I guess it also strikes me as particularly challenging to assess because there's probably a lot of um, a, a debate or room for uh, disagreement uh, on like the, the proper way to I guess what what to recognize and how to respond to it yeah um, I actually had an amazing opportunity this winter to shadow the Alpine RMT uh, in, in Rocky our DCL is, is called RMT Rocky Mountain Trainer um, some divisions call it division clinic leader um, others have an examiner training squad right there's a bunch of different names we use across the country uh, in, and I got to shadow the Alpine Rocky Mountain Trainer uh, Selection Day, and it was such a cool opportunity uh, to see how aligned we were from, from snowboard to alpine, because uh, most of my world's been in the, in the snowboard side at that level. And um, there is, at that level, there's, there's this weird jump where we go from this level one, level two, level three standard, where you say, this is the standard, and this is how, how you achieve this standard. And above that, it's a it's a offer an, often a hiring for a, for a job right for as if if I'm as a committee chair if I'm going to hire you to be an examiner it's no longer just do you have the skills but it's do you have the skills do you fit the the team that we have are you do you bring something to that team um, are you uh, someone who takes feedback well and is able to grow and develop what's you, how how do you present in front of the group there's all of these other elements that that come into play in that 
uh, examiner realm. And, and in our division, the trainer is, is more of a standard. We have a Rocky Mountain standard for that, that trainer, and then the examiners are hired. But in other divisions, that it's kind of a more, more of that hiring side of things, even from the beginning for that DCL. So there's, there's all of these different play, like kind of interchanges when you get into that, that RMT and, and trainer level. I think one of the things that uh, as we as we move forward to the learning connection model, we've been looking at that level one, level two, level three. I, I think there's a number of team, I, I know there's a number of team members who uh, are very passionate about how we start to develop and, and provide tools for becoming a trainer, right? For the, last, uh, for the last number of years, we've relied on schools to teach instructors how to train. We haven't provided a lot of materials as a, from a national level on here's the difference between teaching and training, right? Um, you're a level two instructor at a smaller ski area and you just got handed new hire training. Hey, you're our most certified instructor at this mountain. You're gonna do new hire training this year. What do I need to know as an instructor to, to train instead of teach? And that's, it's just an area we haven't provided a lot of tools and I think it's something that we'll, we'll move into over the next couple of, of years of um, sharing some of those materials that we've used or how, you know, um, when I was running the training program at Vail, here's what I did. Uh, other people, other mountains, here's how they, and starting to pool some of those resources. And, uh, and I would love to see down the road that we have a national trainer process. That's not kind of in the pipeline right now, but I think it's something that we need to get to. Other questions? I maybe have one that's a follow-up question. Yeah. The, um, you talked about the assessment of, um, of the candidates. It seems that there's a lot of different uh, um, ways to go about that. Some do a three-day, some do a two-day, some do a, a teaching segment followed by a skiing segment. So can you talk to that on the different divisions and how they do it differently? And is there going to be any alignment? So alignment, consistency, quality, these are all elements that have driven this conversation and how, how we start to move forward. Uh, in, in starting, what we're looking at is, so the, the last national standards were published or updated in 2009, and, um, and that created this national standard. All the divisions have agreed to, and this is the standard we're working from. But the membership, uh, kind of the the makeup of the membership, the demographic of the membership is so different from division to, to division that we haven't really touched process, like how how that exam is handled. And over the last several years, the focus has been on how do we um, create more consistency among assessment activities? How do we create more consistency across what we're actually doing in the exams? Uh, but there's always going to be room for divisional um, biases in the process and maybe bias isn't the right word but for example i was in uh in minnesota this winter with central division and um spent some time up up in the, up with those members members in uh, uh a couple of the mountains up there afton alps and uh, buck hill and they have the ability to run one day exams because they can start at 9 a.m and go to 9 p.m and most of their membership are have full-time jobs in the city and teaching is just a passion project, it's fun, it's a second job for, for them, a lot of their membership. So for them, running events on the weekends is pretty important uh, and minimizing the number of days that people have to take off work is pretty important. In Rocky, we have a lot of full-time professional instructors who teach all the time. And for us, it's less important about um, that it's a, it's a one-day event and more important that it's uh, happening during a work week when it's a slow business time period, right? So we're not going to run an exam during President's Weekend, pretty probably anywhere in the country, but there's weeks where we have significantly lower business volume and we can run those exams. What I think we'll see as we go through this is, um, for example, uh, the different tasks that we do, the different ways that we assess teaching segments or, um, or movement analysis, because we've got these groups of leaders, divisional leaders together to have these conversations, we're starting to share more ideas and build more alignment, um, kind of more fluidly, more naturally. And it's as simple as like, uh, we've been doing examiner exchanges. So uh, actually two weeks ago, I was supposed to be out on, in Eastern Division 
auditing the level two and level three exam there so that I could see firsthand how they're conducting their exam. Um, you know, we, we've shared the ideas and we know the different ways that we run our exams, but to actually have some of our um, committee chairs and, and um, people that are on the task force see those different events, that's where we're gonna start to get a lot of that movement. And as we build this kind of best practice list of like, here's 20 different ways that we can, ev can evaluate teaching, and here's how it's done in Eastern, here's how it's done in Western, here's how it's done in Central, here's how it's done in Rocky, that starts to grow our organization and, and grow that consistency from a pretty grass, not, maybe not grassroots, but um, from a very natural uh, area. It's not like we're just gonna flip the switch one day and say, oh, we now have this national process, this is what you're gonna do, right? And I think it's important that we maintain that, uh, a, that flexibility from the divisions to, to build events around their membership, but you will start to see growth in, in alignment just through man, this is a great idea from Northwest's Alpine group. We're going to use it in Rocky Mountain Snowboard. And Eastern's like, oh, this is this awesome thing that Rocky Snowboard's doing. We're going to do it in Alpine, right? And all of that's going to start to move forward over the next five years. And, and really, I think looking through this learning outcomes, assessment activities, assessment criteria, all of, all of this academic work that we're doing, things are going to look very different in, in uh, four years, three years when we when we go to levy finland for the 2023 inner ski we're going to have a lot of that in place that we didn't now thanks other questions comments yeah 50 people on somebody's got to have a question Nancy, what role do you envision member schools playing in the development of people skills? It seems like this is an area that could be developed. Definitely. Nancy, do you want to jump on and ask anything else or? No, just if you could address that, that would be great. Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, I think, I think what's great about the learning connection model is that it is, um, it's kind of like smart goals, like it's, it's achievable, it's relatable, it's out there. Uh, the whole point in the learning connection model is that it's something that that everyone can bite into that it's not um it's not something new it's a better way of organizing the materials that we've already had and uh, you know this the, that kind of that idea that we have to hire good people people that that starts from our hiring managers and our ski school directors and our trainers and the people that are at resorts all over the world that say like oh you can't train people skills like i've heard that so many times in the last couple of years like you can't train people skills and you know, when you look at our ski schools, they're full of people who have careers in all sorts of other fields. And when you start looking at the strengths in our, in our ski schools uh, with people that have been through leadership training, through emotional intelligence training, have read, read books, um, you know, have researched different elements of emotional intelligence and people skills, there's so much, so much in the way of resources there. Uh, and I, th I think member schools will pay a huge role in developing those. That you know, as we, as, and, and even if you look at the teaching snow sports manual that came out uh, two years ago, the amount of material, even in that manual two years ago, that starts to get into how we can grow and develop our people skills, um, management of self, awareness of other people's emotions and being able to manage and react, uh, you know, and, and help them manage their emotions. Those are elements that are gonna be put into play at the member school and, and getting the member schools, um, you know, whether it's your hiring manager, your training manager, your ski school director, um, getting them on, on board with this kind of element as, a, as an area to grow and develop, it's only gonna make the school better. And whether that's hiring someone new or looking at your top 10 pros in your locker room and the pros that you most commonly get complaints about in your locker room, and starting to look at how, how, do you sh how do you highlight those positive behaviors and skills? How do, you, how do you train towards those positive behaviors and skills? And how do you provide that information um, you know, in a non-threatening way to the people in the locker room that need that people skill development, right? And so this isn't, this isn't something that happens overnight. We're giving ourselves permission to talk about people skills and to talk about these behaviors and, and, and abilities to train and, and learn here. But that doesn't mean overnight, everyone's going to be welcome to, to walk them in. Hey, I've got some feedback for you, right? So um, it takes time to grow and develop in, in that direction. 
And I think one of the key ways that starts is if you're in a leadership role in your ski school is making it clear that you are welcome, that you yourself welcome feedback, that you want to hear that feedback, that, um, that you aren't just going to give feedback to everyone, but that you want to hear it and, and that you, you acknowledge that you have room to grow as well, right? We all have opportunities to grow and, and better ourselves. And um, when you start asking for that feedback, it's not always easy. I, I, you know, you don't always get feedback that you want to hear. And that's that opportunity uh, to, to go to the drawing board and, and figure out where you need to work on yourself. And it's, it's, uh, it's something, you know, I think we all need to be aware of. I'm certainly very aware of in, in areas that I'm trying to grow and develop and, and seeking feedback. That, that starts from the member school. And, uh, and I think, I think it's, uh, it's key for every single one of us and for our schools to start to, to embrace that. I'm curious about um, what change in, I'm interested in assessments and how the assessments will uh, pan out in the new format. Um, what kind of change would I expect to see in the assessments after uh, examination um, about performance? Um, I'm used to uh, assessments that I find actual uh, material to work with, uh, whether it be successful or critical. Um, so in, my, in the assessments going forward, well, I don't expect to see uh, much of a change in what kinds of things are referenced and how concrete those items will be. Um, for example, um, if it happens to do with like a movement pattern, I'm used to on my assessment that you know there's a, uh, an opportunity for you to improve on some type of uh, you know execution of my skill. If it has to do with uh, knowledge, then I would have an opportunity to see that what I presented had strengths and weaknesses in X, Y, or Z area. Um, I'm just curious how the assessments would be able to show and what they would tell me. I'm expected uh, to build off of them. Um, well, I think it's not time to comment. Yeah, great question, Brandon. Great question. Thank you. Um, so I think I think uh, a couple of key pieces on this. First is uh, a new format, a learning connection model. We're not looking at changing the standard, right? None of none of what I've talked about today um, changes the actual standard of exams or what the level one, the level two, or level three is. What it does change is the materials available for training, and I think the clarity of some of uh, the feedback that a candidate would get uh, af after their exam. So uh, to, to get specific, um, the, one of the things the fundamentals do really well is, the technical fundamentals do real well, is they put relationships between body movements and, and ski equipment, snowboard performance, and the, the purpose of that in terms of uh, evaluation is really putting the highlight on the movements. And I think we often get hung up on, on the task. Oh, I didn't do my dynamic shorts right. I didn't perform my switch cross under turns right. Like we get hung up on the task itself. I didn't complete the 360. But what it comes down to is the movements, right? The, the successful candidate is able to perform the movements that allow them to do that task. And most often when we see people be unsuccessful when it comes to tasks, there's a movement pattern that is uh, visible throughout multiple different performances, right? You, you do several different tasks and there's a movement pattern that shows up in all of those tasks that the candidate's unable to make a change to. So most often it's about movements, not tasks. And I think, I think we get hung up on the task really easily. Similarly, on the teaching and people skills side of things, uh, we have a, a some kind of teach performance that we're doing. And within that, there's all of these um, elements and you get your scorecard at the end and it has, uh, you, you can see where you're scored on all of these different elements. What the learning outcomes and the assessment activities do uh, and assessment criteria is start to standardize that scorecard across that assessment form across all of the divisions, all the disciplines, so that you're gonna see more similar items on those assessment forms. Um, and those assessment forms with assessment criteria tie straight to that performance guide that says, these are the things that a successful candidate did. These are the things that, a, that an unsuccessful candidate, like this is what it might look like for success. This is what it might look like for 
uh, for someone who is not successful. Um, so you're gonna see that same level of detail. I think specifically with teaching and people skills, as far as I know, none of the divisions have had previously a line item or, or any line items that specifically call out people skills. I know in Rocky, we had professionalism as a line item during teaching. And that's an area where you can start to say, there's some people skills involved in that. Um, there's people skills that have been in, like that have been factored into scoring on teaching like blocks or in movement analysis or in technical understanding. Like there's been people skills evaluated, but there hasn't been a, a way to measure or, or evaluate that in a consistent uh, or, or maybe a fair manner across all exams. And so um, what I think this leads to is more consistent scoring, more consistent uh, assessment kind of across disciplines, across divisions, and better opportunity to receive that feedback from your, from your examiners, as well as, so you just receive this exam and, and you, re you see that you were unsuccessful on your teach and you can pull up that performance guide, which is gonna have, I mean, these spreadsheets are like 600, 800 lines of, of content currently. Uh, and you know, eventually it'll make its way into a published document where you'll be able to look at, at your teach and say, okay, I was, I was unsuccessful on adapting my lesson to the needs of the student. And what does that actually mean? Well, here in the performance guide, here are six examples of ways that you can adapt your lesson to the needs of the student. And here are six ways that someone maybe was unsuccessful in adapting their lesson to, uh, to the needs of the student. And, and as the candidate, oh yeah, I did that, I did that, I did that. I, I, I guess I didn't actually adapt to the needs of the student, right? Here's, here's other ways that I can do it next time. And as a trainer at the resort, you're gonna be able to take that scorecard and go straight to that assessment, um, that uh, performance guide with the assessment activity and say, let's go work on these elements that make a success instead of a, a, a unsuccessful. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. And somebody checks every single book that I've ever given. Thanks, Brandon. Um, from Mindy Brill, what direction are we going to address the changing demographics of our clientele as well as professionals, i.e. senior assessments? Um, a number of divisions already do have a senior specialist kind of, uh, of exam, uh, a way to kind of specialize in, in teaching uh, aging, you know, and there's, there's a number of schools that have invested in programs about how to ski. Um, I, I know one of them is called Ski Younger Now. I've seen that one out a few different times. Um, you know, ways to ski lower impact or, or conserve uh, kind of that impact or energy to be able to ski longer and, and um, you know, different ways to specialize in, in teaching more senior and aging demographic. Um, you know, I think those are elements, again, going, you know, there's divisional processes to create different uh, specializations. And then as that gains traction, that moves into a national process and we start to standardize those across, across divisions. Um, I don't know specifically where that one, that project is at right now or kind of where, that, where that's going, but um, I'm, sh I'm sure it's something that is on a number of people's minds as, as, they, as we do look at a, a you know, aging clientele as well as you know, aging instructors. Like I'm, we're all getting older every year and, uh, and knowing how to, how to perform your best as an instructor and, and um, you know, do your job most effectively, it means skiing differently as you age. And so um, I, I definitely imagine there will be movement in that direction. Um, Dave, anything you wanna add there? Uh, Ingi, what other snow sports instructor bodies across the world have you learned from? It seems Cassie has already invented a bunch of the wheels you're looking for. Yeah, so um, this was actually one of the coolest parts of Interski was was sharing some of this information and 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 discussing with other snow sports national bodies and professionals around the world. And um, you know, I think we are. Th there's elements that Cassie has absolutely pulled in. Um, we've we've spoken a good bit with Basie and some of the work they've been doing. A number of the ski industry or other ski organizations are doing similar things. Uh, I think we are really the only ones that have fully separated out that teaching skills and people skills world uh, and, and looked at these as one of, the, one of the pillars of great instruction is that people skills element. Um, and it was pretty cool. I think you guys can be really proud of the organization and, and, and the way that we uh, kind of uh, represent you at, at events like Interski. 
uh, I didn't quite understand, like people have compared inner ski to the instructor Olympics. And, and I thought that was like a pretty big word to use, like to, to kind of compare what we do to what professional athletes do at, at their level at the Olympics. And coming back from inner ski, pretty much the only way I've been able to describe the event to people is it's pretty much like the instructor equivalent of the Olympics. Um, <laughs> it's, it's really the only way to describe it, that event and just the, the, the way that it unfolds and, and representing your country at an, an event like that. Uh, is is incredibly humbling and and we learn just as much as we as we brought there I think what I wasn't prepared for was how much the rest of the world looks to the United States for what we're doing there you know the the foundation of the American teaching system was that guest centered approach where uh, many of the European instructor organizations were still in the uh, uh, you will do this this way. This is how you learn. You know, you're going to do step A, then B, then C. Um, you know, we're pretty dismissive of the American teaching system and the guest centric approach 30 years ago. And now many of them are facing what we were at 20 years ago in, in moving in that more guest centered way. Um, you know, they're, they're seeing that people don't show up to ski with, with professional ski racers. They want the more subtle approach to skiing they want to learn how to how to skid their ski they want to learn how to control the ski not go 90 miles an hour and and so that demographic is changing there but um there are other organizations that are taking some of the same steps and, and i think uh as we've globalized through the internet and through you know video conferencing like this it's let us share those ideas more easily um it's let us build together rather than everyone building in their own silos and um and there's definitely been a lot of collaboration with some of the organ other organizations. Uh, there's, there's elements that we've borrowed from them. There's elements that other organizations are borrowing from us. And I think, you know, the next inner ski is going to be really interesting to see where things are at in terms of people skills as a, as a more universally looked at skill across all of the organizations. Um, thanks for that, Ingi. Um, yeah, happy to answer other questions. We're at an hour and a half, but I'm happy to keep going and answer any other questions. If people have them, feel free to throw a uh, question in the chat or unmute and ask a question. Right on. Hey, Chris, thanks a lot for doing it tonight. This is a great session. No worries, no worries. I'm going to um, pop my email address uh, into the group chat here. If you have, if you do come up with other questions um, and or or other stuff you want to discuss or or uh, follow up on, feel free to shoot me an email or uh, jump on Instagram or other social media. Right on. Hey, thanks, thanks so much for joining in. I know uh, it's a little bit uh, different spring. You know, we're not at uh, at National Academy or headed to National Academy next week, or wrapping up our Vail Spring Fling events, or uh, you know, all of our other across the country different spring events and season wrap up events. But um, it's great just seeing familiar faces and catching up and sharing some information. And um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity for, to present. Thanks for jumping on here, and look forward to next time. Feel free to follow up, shoot emails, or uh, or anything else. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate no it, dude. Thanks, Bagel. Thanks, Chris. See you later. Everything was great. Really Thanks, Chris. Take care, man. Thanks, Thanks Chris. Guys.